Hello everyone. Um, welcome to this Upcycling Android workshop, um, Train the Trainers. I'm Max and um, yeah, today we want to talk. Um, I'm First of all, I'm happy that you, you're all here. Um, and today we have four different talks. Um, first of all, Eric, uh, who will talk about the Upcycling Android campaign. Then myself, um, we're talking about the workshops uh, that we've done and the insights that we've gotten from the workshops. And then Marvin uh, is going to talk about MicroG. He's the main developer uh, for MicroG. And finally, Hans Christoph is going to close it up with FDroid to talk about FDroid, and he's the lead maintainer of FDroid. So with that, I'm handing it over to Eric. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. I switched the slides here a second. Okay, cool. Great to see so many people here. Um, unfortunately, I'm pretty sick. So I hope I manage my talk without um, having too much coughing uh, in between. I will do my best and uh, the good news on this is I keep it short and to the point. So the upside, uh, by the way, you can, so there is, uh, as you have seen in, on the slide before, there's 30 minutes, uh, there's a 30 minute slot now for this. I will not talk 30 minutes. Um, and in the end of, uh, of my presentation, you will have the time to for questions and answers and these things. So let's get it started. The upcycling Android campaign. Um, I will try to give some background on that. And uh, yeah, many people are wondering or asking us uh, because they have heard or know about the free or Android campaign. Now we have an upcycling Android campaign, and I wanted to, yeah, to shed some light. Why? What is the difference? Why is the difference? The free Android campaign was a campaign many years ago. Uh, meanwhile, ten years ago that we have started that campaign, and that was in a time when <clears throat> very few people have n or knew about free software operating systems um, on mobile phones. So. Back back in the time, our main goal was to promote these free software the already existing, which were very few, but there were some free software operating systems that you can use to replace the the, the Google's Android. And by doing this, achieve freedom and um, and be in control of your device. We already had a public campaign on that, and we're giving some workshops. Um, trying to help people flashing their phones because this was even more difficult 10 years ago than it is nowadays. So that's how we started with the, let's say with the world of free software on, on mobile phones. And um, yes. And like, the main running time of that campaign, it was like from 2013 to 15. And after that, we mainly concentrated on um, promoting Android and uh, the idea behind flashing phones, but not so much anymore on a concrete campaign as we have before. Then some years later, exactly eight, eight years later, um, we picked up this idea again. So many things have changed. There is nowadays a, a, like um, a diverse uh, choice of free software operating systems out there. And um, instead of mainly having the goal to let people know about that there is a free software uh, alternative available for your phone, this time we wanted to shed light on how you can use these free software operating systems to extend your hardware lifetime. 
how this works in concrete, I will just talk in the next chapter. So I leave it here for now. Um, and uh, again, we had just basically the same method. So we were setting up a public campaign and doing workshops and are still doing workshops um, for people to get them started with flashing their phones. So where's the difference? Uh, of course, the, the time, the running, the main running time, we already had that, I mean, eight years difference. And there's also the different target groups. So for your Android was the main target group, like people who love free software and then getting, because as I said, back then it was not so well known. So getting them the knowledge about using free software on mobile phones. Well, the upcycling Android campaign has mainly a target group in, people who are aware of, um, who like to extend their hardware lifetime, who do not like to replace their phone every two years, just because the manufacturer tells them to do so, and are more like environmental um, friendly. Of course, the material is different. Um, we still have material from the free Android campaign, but it's kind of outdated. There are apps, that we have been promoted back then, who are just not up to date anymore. And uh, so the material from the upside and Android campaign is much more up to date, is also more diverse. There's a video, uh, a web page, and so on. So the material is quite more like advanced. So much about the to understand this this background now let's talk about the core idea about upcycling android the core idea is free software can save lives the, my my most beloved sentence i've ever written um it can save lives of hardware how how does it work there's a thing we call software obsolescence and um, so this picture shows you how it should, how in an ideal world it should work. Like you buy a, a device today with a software version X, and then the next version comes out, you install it, and you go on and on and on and on. Unfortunately, in our reality business world, this does not work because Manufacturers want to sell new phones. They don't want you to use your phone for years and years and years. They want to sell new flagship phones. So what happens is um, after a year or two or three, they say, okay, um, there's no more support for your phone available. Um, you have to buy the new flagship phone in order to get up-to-date software, which then in effect leads to the and often to the end of hardware because um, I have a security problem. I have no more software that is up to date. And so I just have to buy a new phone just in order to run the new version. This problem can be solved with free software because there is in, this is very particular for the Android world, there are so-called custom ROMs which are forks from from the main Android um, software. And um, without the, fortunately, without the, the Google um, stuff, uh, and sometimes with some additional software packages. And what happens here now is they don't have the, they don't sell hardware they don't sell a new flagship phone. What they want you to achieve is that you switch to their to their version of Android and that you stay in their version of Android. So they they try hard to, um, to make the new version available for your old phone. And this works very often. So instead of having to buy a new phone, you can switch to this custom ROM version and then go on and on and on how it should be. This is not only true for custom ROMs, which is anyway a very particular case for Android. This is also true for basically any free software operating system. You can also install a complete Linux system and go from there. <clears throat> Sorry. 
And then you can go from there and um, use a Linux system on your phone and go on and on and on. And this is not only true for um, for mobile phones or for using mobile phones as mobile phones. You can also use, I mean, mobile phones are super powerful computers. Um, you can use them for many, many things, not only for phone calls and messaging. You can, in the world we are uh, envisioning, this is uh, a universal computer. You should be able to replace it with any free software operating system that fits on on the hardware and that you want to install. And then you can use it, for example, in in your garden for automatic watering, or you can use it in your home for your TV, media station, and so on and so on. So this is how free software can save lives of hardware. This is the core idea of upcycling Android in a sense of reusing the resources that have been invested into producing the phone and upcycle it for a new use. Then we have some core environmental aspects um, in the involved that I also want to shed some light on. So if you give the workshop, this is what we just have heard. This is the main idea that we usually promote in the workshop, why we are running the workshop and why it is useful for people to keep using the hardware. And I'll give you some environmental argumentations, how that is also helpful for our planet. The problem is that one of the problems is the production of phones in this case. Here's a Apple carbon footprint report that um, is not Android, of course, but it should be very similar and is transparent. And it shows that basically 80% of the whole, um, of the whole carbon footprint of an Apple phone um, happens in the production and in the worldwide transportation and less than 20% in the actual use of the product. So if we want to do something for the environment, we should reduce the production. And on the other side, we have the problem of the e-waste. So whenever I buy a new phone and I throw away my old phone, I produce e-waste. Um, the global e-waste monitor counts 53 million tons of e-waste in 2019. Um, and I think it's like 10% of them, meanwhile, are tablets and phones. So the longer I use my phone, I reduce production and I reduce e-waste. And I have some numbers here because numbers sometimes show it more clear. So I counted it, uh, calculated it for the smartphone. So I looked up this. It says we produce 1.5 billion smartphones every year. That's a lot. And as we have heard, 80% of the overall uh, carbon footprint happens in production and worldwide transportation. And 10% of this is meanwhile phones and tablets and similar devices. So coming back to upcycling Android, depending on what statistics you're looking at and who has paid the money for the uh, research, Android has a market share of 70 to 90%. So let's make it easy and say, okay, 66%. So no one can blame me on my numbers. This is still 1 billion phones. Then, um, no, no, let's also say, okay, 50% of those people are new customers. They have never had a phone before and only 50% replaced their already existing phone. And then it's just 500 million. Just. <laughs> let's say one third of those 
if they would use their phone just one year longer, this would be already 166 million smartphones from not having been produced every year. That's what our vision is, our environmental vision is behind upcycling Android. And it would reduce already 500,000 tons of electronic waste. One second, please. Okay, so that's the environmental aspect that we talk about in our workshops. Um, as you know, the FSFE is a political organization, so we also have some core political demands that we talk about in our workshops. <laughs> the problems that can be fixed by politics that we face nowadays are mainly, I mean, now we have seen, okay, free software, we can use free software and we can use our hardware for more time, for a longer time. Um, but it's not that easy. Why? Because there are technical restrictions. We have end user license agreements that uh, void warranty or other things when I do it. Then for the developers, we have the problem of proprietary drivers and interfaces and tools. So it's very hard for them to write uh, or replace the operating system here or there, or to use all the hardware from the phone with, with their own uh, written operating system. More and more, the platform economy says, okay, you cannot use my service in case you have, um, in case you're running a, a custom ROM on your phone and so on and so on. So we have uh, a lot of problems, but we have regulations, political regulations. This can be solved if we tell politicians how to do it correctly. And there's a chance currently because there's a renegotiation of the European eco design. This means the European uh, Parliament and Council. There are several directives um, who, who make new rules for the European eco design of products. For example, how long can a phone last? how long should there should be updates and so on. And this is the point where we jump in. Um, and we have written an open letter in preparation to that because we asked for the universal right to install any software on any device. If you look for this open letter, uh, it's of course on fsv.org. You can sign the letter, you can read it. There are four core demands that I'm not having the time now to go deeper into it. Um, but the point is, we, as you have seen, free software can save lives of hardware. And um, in order to make more use out of this, we need this universal right to install any software on any device. Okay, the so time is running. Five minutes more. Is there a question right now? Because actually, now I would jump to a totally different topic. And um, maybe I can take two questions here because I don't see any. If you have a question, by the way, I think we should have solved it. You can either, like I do it now, you can uh, make a plus here in the chat. And we see that you have a question. Or you can write the question also into the chat. Like if you make this plus, you will be able to, we can call your name and you will be able to talk. Or you can write your question into the chat. Okay, as I... The slides will be shared. Yes, I think so. Um, and I will we will share it in the wiki. There. In the wiki, in the upcycling Android, in the FSFE wiki, there's an upcycling Android section that lists all the um, all the upcycling Android uh, workshops. So it will also list this one. 
and from there there we can post the presentations and it's of course also recorded but yeah so you can also get the slides okay is there are no more questions right now as i see it i will move on to a different topics so if you because you are here uh, because you also hopefully want to do a workshop on your own so now i told you about what could be the content of it or how we or what have been the points we were talking about in a workshop and i will now tell you also um in case you decide to do a workshop how the fsfe can help you because of course if you do a workshop we want you to have a lot of uh, visitors so the fsfe can help you with this when you decide to do a workshop so we ju I just told you in in the fsfv wiki there's a upcycling android section there there's a list of all past workshops and this one as well so you can look there there's some descriptions there's also rules that we decided for the um, registrations and so on so we can skip them through and you can copy paste elements of that and use it as a template basically for your own workshop and of course create your own workshop also in the list so everyone knows about it then in the next step the, your workshop will end up on the fsfe's website event section so fsfe.org slash events we list all events uh, organized for and by the fsfe and um, your workshop will end up there. Um, from there, it goes all the ways through our mailing list, or let's say, I mean, even better, you you use our mailing list, depending on where you are, we have regional mailing lists. So you can post there and say, hey, we are organizing this after Android workshop, who has time to help, to join, to hack, to be there then we ourselves again have the social media accounts so we will promote your workshops on our social media accounts um to make sure people who are more using social media know about it um then of course we have the printed material we if you text us about the workshop we will send you posters, stickers, flyers, everything you need. You can put it in your hacking space or wherever you're doing the workshop. You can give it to your visitors. And um, yeah. And as a special feature, we can also send a mail to FSV supporters in a certain region. So say you're doing a workshop in France, uh, in Toulouse. So we can say, okay, let's, write, let's send a mail to all FSV supporters in Toulouse and 50 kilometers around and let them know. Um, and of course, in our newsletter sent out monthly, we will uh, in advance also let people know about your workshop. So in time, uh, one minute left. There's a question from Gabri Ponzo. I think you can speak just by unmuting yourself. But if you are doing this now, I cannot hear you. He only joined Aya. He is joining with uh, the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, I was not prepared to, to speak. <laughs> By the way, more than a question, it was just a suggestion. You were talking about the uh, political side of this campaign, which is really uh, interesting. Uh, but uh, as far as I can see, uh, whenever you have your um, operating system uh, freed, let's say from Google, uh, for example, then uh, a problem can be the apps because most of them realize they rely on uh, on Google services or other uh, dependencies uh, which are present in the, uh, let's say, uh, usual Android. So the, the suggestion is uh, probably they have already thought about that. But uh, my suggestion was to add to this uh, political campaign uh, this side, because when you have 
whenever you will have the, uh, the free operating system on, the, on, on your mobile phone, then it is not granted that the apps would be available or uh, working. And so the, the regulation should uh, oblige, should force the, uh, the uh, developers of these apps to be uh, independent from Google services or what, whatever other kind of uh, mm -hmm. service uh, or um, dependency uh, included in, in the cost, uh, usual Android. That's it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, this might be a problem here and there. But on the other hand, I think, uh, so on one hand, you can replace you can find help maybe in using MicroG, which we hear later about it, in using particular apps um, on your free software operating system. And I think it's a bit more complicated to put that on any developer, having an app being universal instead of putting that on, on the hardware, but okay. Just my first guess. So uh, thank you very much. My time is over uh, and I'm handing over or getting giving back to Max again. Hey, um, so I hope everybody can hear me. I am Max, and um, this is the second part of the workshop where I'll talk about, and you can reach me via matrix or email, um, where I'll talk about the workshop key takeaways, the workshop uh, frequently asked questions, and also um, in the end, the supporting material you have for the workshops. So um, about the workshop key takeaways. Um, this, by the way, is a picture taken uh, in Bozen at the SFSCon during one of our upcycling Android workshops. The first one uh, would be to pair participants. I think this is what you would normally do, um, making small groups of people, two to three people, for example, um, and pair participants that bring a phone that they want to flash with more experienced participants, also known as flashes, because arguably the expectation would be that um, the phone they, they bring will be flashed. Um, and that would be like a successful workshop for them. And others who didn't bring a phone um, to flash can be paired with participants of the same skill level so they can both learn together. Then, um, second key takeaway is um, bring test devices if you have them, because uh, quite a few participants in these workshops, actually, we would just like to try out a custom operating system first. Uh, and by custom ROM, I always mean a free software operating system. It's just same, uh, same term for that uh, before they flash it on their own phone. And then um, also just how to get some experience how to flash a phone which can be also non-trivial. Then for the third point, um, bring extra hardware, especially USB-C to USB-A cables. This is the first picture in the presentation. Um, this is mainly for older laptops that only have USB-A ports and newer uh, smartphones with USB-C uh, ports um, to have some compatibility with that. But also USB-A to USB-C adapters. Um, That's the second image. Uh, for the other way around, if you have like a newer um, laptop that only has USB-C ports, then connecting to an older smartphone that you know they have micro USB ports or something um, is very useful. And bring some USB sticks. Always useful, you know, um, for data transfer. Um, and also if you have them laptops with Linux installed and the Android SDK. Then um, the fourth point is downloading factory images beforehand, especially if you bring test devices, just have some 
uh, factory images of a free software operating system, download it and transfer them to the USB sticks and hand them out to the participants. So this is uh, especially useful uh, if the Wi-Fi isn't that good at the workshop location, but you know, make sure beforehand uh, to check and uh, this is always a good good thing to do. Um, this is a um, quite important thing. Have or tell the participants to have um, to back up their data on the phone beforehand before they come with their phone to the workshop, because doing doing this during the workshop can easily take um, you know the whole amount of uh, time that the workshop is going for, and uh, you don't want to be doing this or you know doing this for one person and then checking. Uh, every time like what about this data and that and it's just a, a very time time consuming task and lastly um the workshop regist registration um have them register before the workshop like online using some form um this helps you answer two important questions one how many people are attending so you have an idea of how many helpers you would need. And then also um, they could tell you what devices they are bringing um, to, to Flash. And then you can research, is there like a custom operating system, Android operating system for it available? Uh, if not, um, it's going to be difficult to to do um, to come or to develop one on your own, so just tell them it's probably not possible to, to flash a custom operating system on their phone. And if yes, well, you could consider downloading a custom ROM in advance, depending on the Wi-Fi situation at the workshop location, or just tell them uh, please download the custom operating system in advance, so uh, you don't have to wait um, for this process to complete. This brings me to um, the second talking point of this um, presentation, the workshop FAQ. So there are three questions ranked by you know popularity that were asked. And by far the most popular one was, how do I choose a device to flash? Then can I trust an unofficial custom ROM releases distributed on the XDA forums? This um, arose because, um, well, for the phones they bring, oftentimes there's not an official release, like an official lineage OS release. And then you can you can always look for the in the XDA forums, uh, which by the way is like a forum for custom ROM de developers to exchange themselves if there's an unofficial uh, lineage OS release, for example. Um, and yeah, the question is like, how trustworthy are these uh, these factory images? And third, uh, why are Google Pixel phones well suited for custom ROMs? And this is because in our workshops, the test devices are Google Pixel phones. So we um, we're bringing those phones, and yes, they are well suited for custom Android operating systems. So about the first one, how do I choose a device to flash? Uh, the most important question to ask yourself here is how is the support for a free software operating system for, for this device I'm interested in? So there are many custom operating systems on the market. Um, by far the most popular one is Lineage OS. Um, it, has, it supports a large number of devices and you, you know, might just find this device being supported um, for your for your phone that you want to buy. Then Replicant uh, builds on top of Lineage OS and uh, puts the focus on the freedom aspect. So Lineage OS, although it's a free software operating system, um, it uses proprietary drivers and firmware to to make a fully functioning system. And Replicant makes a point in replacing these proprietary parts with free software counterparts. Unfortunately, it only uh, supports older phones, older Samsung phones. And then Calyx OS and the one on the right, Graphene OS, um, they are more modern um, uh, operating systems for Android, and they focus on privacy and the security aspect. 
Um, another point is um, important point is like how long will my device get support? And this is very much in the spirit of upcycling Android. Um, for Graphene OS, and I'll stick to the to the custom ROMs I've I've named before. Um, it's until the manufacturer provides updates. So in this case, it's Google because they only support Google Pixel phones. And to give you an idea, Google Pixel um, version six and newer gets five years of support by the manufacturer, uh, by Google. And then um, the Google Pixel 5a and older gets three years. Um, and then for Calyx OS, it's almost the same as Rafine OS. They just support them a little bit longer until the matching Linux kernel LTS version is supported. Um, and they also almost support the same devices, um, with the exception being Fairphone 4 right now for the Calyx OS. And then for Linux OS, it's actually not that clear. There are no official dates. Um, and it very much depends on the device maintainer, how long he wants to support the device. And he could drop the support at any time. Like, um, cases have, there are like cases where they lose their phone, they break their phone, get a new phone that's not the same one, and then drop the support. So one metric um, to look at that can be useful is the popularity for the device uh, amongst users. So the NHOS has a uh, telemetry um, by default, I think enabled. And um, so it reports how many, um, uh, if there's a device with um, with LineageOS installed to a server, namely stats.lineageOS.org. And the top three devices in the number of installs as of now, as of today, are Xiaomi Mi 5, 6, and the Samsung Galaxy S7, whereby Xiaomi Mi 5 and 6 are by far the most installed devices. So you could, you could think that, or you could argue, um, like if the maintainer, um, uh, drops the support for Xiaomi uh, Mi 5. Among these users, there's probably going to be one that is willing to, to pick up the support and the maintenance um, for this model. But popularity amongst users is not the same as popularity amongst developers. And for developers, um, it's quite important um, what the quality of the kernel source code releases by the manufacturer are. And they can be different, they are very different. Um, and this makes it harder or easier to actually build a vanilla Android open source, uh, a vanilla Android OS based on the Android open source project together with the kernel source code. And two players or two manufacturers that have been known to, to make good high quality kernel source code releases are Google. Google, obviously, um, you know, uh, is overseeing the development of the Android open source project. And then Sony with their, with their um, Xperia open devices in initiative. And then um, just a few more points. If you're looking to buy phone second hand, can the bootloader be unlocked? This is the prerequisite to install a custom operating system on it. Um, and there are exceptions, um, even though in general the, the model, you know, has a bootloader that can be unlocked. For example, carrier phones sold in the US and Canada, they can ship with unlockable bootloaders. So AT&T, Verizon are two um, carriers um, that do that. And for our workshops, we bought uh, phone refurbished phones. And one of them is a carrier phone. We didn't know that, but it has an encrypted bootloader and it can't be flashed. Um, and this is uh, hard to actually circumvent. Like you need to reflash the firmware and that's uh, very hard to do. I mean, it's just a very advanced topic and I haven't seen anybody doing that um, or posting about that online. So second thing is, is the phone carrier locked? Oftentimes you will see um, like secondhand advertisements saying there's no SIM lock. And this is basically what this is about. Uh, mobile phone carriers can actually um, lock um, the, the SIM 
uh, the, the mobile phone to a particular SIM card. Um, and this is implemented in a modem and is a completely different thing from the bootloader uh, being unlockable. And you generally, you don't want to, to only be using one SIM, one SIM card from one uh, specific carrier. And then lastly, um, is the phone blacklisted, uh, meaning is it a stolen or lost device? And you can check that uh, with the IMEI number. So ask for that if you buy it second hand. And then there's some websites where you can check if this is actually a blacklisted phone. Then um, for the second question, can I trust unofficial releases? So unofficial releases in this case, oftentimes on the XDA, on the XDA forums, oftentimes mean unofficial uh, lineage OS releases. And the problem with these releases are there are no, um, no quality requirements. Um, so lineage OS, in contrast to that, has a charter where they list different um, things in terms of hardware, in terms of software that need to be supported. And in, on the XDA forums, anybody can post their custom ROM build and um, three important things to ask here. And the most important one is, is the source code available? Um, if it's available, the work can be carried on if the support is dropped by the current maintainer. Also, you can audit it yourself for security and you can build a custom ROM yourself if you're really paranoid. And um, a lot of people, you know, can't audit a uh, custom ROM for its security and not build it themselves. So the second point is what's the reputation of the developer? Has he built any other custom ROMs? Um, where is he active? Is he maybe one of the um, project project developers at the Lineage OS? This also happens. They post unofficial um, releases first on XDA for testing, and then uh, this later becomes an official uh, Lineage OS um, supported device. And then lastly, what are other users' experiences? It's a forum. They post um, in a thread what their experiences have been. And this is especially useful to know, like what's what's the, the state of the hardware support, what is working, what not. Um, sometimes the camera is not working, um, stuff like that. And then lastly, um, what's, uh, why are Google Pixel phones well suited for custom um, Android operating systems? Um, first of all, Google Pixel are the reference devices for the Android open source project. And so it's really easy to create a custom ROM for it. And it's very easy to flash this custom ROM on the device as well. And this might be the reason uh, this is might be that Google is interested in a you know custom uh, ROM scene around Android uh, because this scene will come back with enhancements and innovations to the um, uh, Android open source project, and these can be contributed back upstream. And in the end, Google just wants Android to be adopted as widely as possible, and for Android to run on, you know, every mobile uh, phone. So, um, yeah, they want the Android open source project to be a successful project. Um, okay, um, now for the supporting material for the workshops, um, there's this link, um, which points to a Git repo and there we, um, we we kind of uh, bundle all the work, uh, resources we have um, made so far for the workshops. So for one, these are flashing instructions uh, for the command line actually for Google OnePlus and Samsung phones. So um, we actually flashed um, uh, the Google Pixel phones we have with uh, Calyx OS that has been easy. Um, the OnePlus phones with PostMarket OS was also not so difficult. And then Samsung phones with Lineage OS, uh, which has been more difficult for sure, especially a difficult task to flash them back to the stock operating system. Uh, OnePlus and Samsung, that is. Google, um, they actually document that, so that's not difficult. 
but uh, in case of OnePlus and Samsung, it's not documented, and you actually might want to do that sometimes to get the newest firmware and the uh, newer drivers. And then the FAQ, I just talked about these three questions from the workshops, um, written in more detail. Um, that's in a document that's also in, um, in the workshop materials. And then lastly, uh, live USB Linux images with Android SDK installed. And um, these factory images also included. And um, I think I didn't talk about that first, but I mean, the main reason uh, for that is um, because people sometimes have Windows PCs and um, not used anymore to, to working on a Windows PC. You need to install some weird drivers uh, to actually be able to talk to the phone. And so we rather have uh, them boot a Linux uh, operating system and then work from there to flash the phone. Okay, um, this is my last slide. So do we have any questions? Mm. Question by Alexandro. When, where will the workshop be organized? But this is referencing something else, no? Or can you elaborate what you mean? Yes, just write a plus if you have a question. Sorry, yeah, now I understand. So um, for Alessandro's question, he's interested in participating. How can he be, infor be informed about the next workshops for flashing um, uh, phones, uh, Android phones? So it's going to be announced on the website. So we have fs fsfe.org slash events. Um, I think it's also, uh, there's also an RSS feed, so you can be informed via that. Um, as Eric said, there's a, going to be a post in the wiki forums, um, and that's about it, I think. And we will post it on Mastodon. Um, but this is, this is, I think, more um, short term. Is there a list of all custom rooms we can trust? Um, there's a... Um, Okay, um, so first for Oliver's question, is there a list of cost, all custom ROMs you can trust? Um, well, I, I would say you can trust the custom ROMs that are actually open source. And there's a Wikipedia site listing all the custom ROMs. I can post it later. Um, so yeah, and these you can trust, I would say. And then for Gabri Ponzo's question, what if a device is not supported? Um, Yes, this um, in the workshops um, when people say or email me that they have a device and I look for a custom ROM for it and it's not supported. Um, I, I mean, it's a lot of work to, um, and they can make it very hard for you, the manufacturers, to actually develop one a custom ROM. So I, I tell them it's not possible. Uh, of course, if you really up for the task, you can develop a custom ROM yourself for the device. Um, 
just give up. Yeah, I mean, go on the XDA forums. Maybe somebody has been, you know, cooking something up, um, and they can share that. But um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a difficult um, task to develop a custom run. Uh, what to do if it all goes wrong and as a trainer you lack the experience um, by Nico. So yes, uh, I think this could have been a question because I didn't do that many workshops yet, but this could have been a question uh, in the workshops as well, like what, 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 uh, how, how likely is it that I break my device? Breaking means like render it unusable. Um, but I think this is maybe a problem of the past as well, not for the newer devices that much. They always have like a fail safe. Um, so there you can, can be pretty sure that you can recover from, and uh, most of the bricks, uh, the so-called bricks are actually soft bricks. So you can, um, reset them with some, uh, firmware tools, the, the devices that is. Uh, yeah, what Kevin says, like, uh, make the research first about the phone you're about to buy. Ah, uh, yes, this is the, this is the link I was talking about, I think. I was, I was thinking about the list of custom Android distributions, yes. And there they have, uh, a column about open source and uh, it will tell you what is actually open source um, and whatnot. Thank you, Oliver. You're welcome. Um, so let me check. Okay, I'm not sure right now if that end was intended. But the times anyway hey. come. Yeah, yeah um, I'm just writing Marvin right now, uh, making sure that he is able to uh, do the next presentation. Okay, so next in a row, as we can see, is Marvin giving us some insights on MicroG. He's the person who can tell us why MicroG rocks. And can we give him the presenter?
hello yes it works Okay, can everyone see the slides? Does it work? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right. Good. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about micro G. Uh, I have recycled some very old slides because I apparently haven't done a presentation about micro G for several years now. So, uh, let, let, let's see if that works out. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so the, the first thing, uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone of you has not heard about MicroG yet, so I'm, but I'm starting here as if it was the case. Uh, so the, the one, the, the pitch sentence that, that uh, uh, at some point I brought up uh, to, to, to describe what MicroG is, um, that's, uh, it is the framework consisting of libraries, services, and patches to create a fully compatible Android distribution that comes without any proprietary Google component. So um, that's just the pitch, but now we want to understand how, how what, what that actually means. So uh, I'm, I'm going a few steps back and uh, looking into what Android actually is. So um, uh, as, you, as you probably have heard, Android is an open source project or the AOSP is an open source project. And there's uh, project includes a lot of stuff that is needed to actually have a full fully operational operating system. And you know, it has a, it has a boost loader, it, 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 consists, it contains a Linux kernel, has something. So they can talk to various kinds of hardware, like uh, which, which means drivers and, and also some user space components. Um, it also has like a, a load of system services so that applications that use it have, uh, have some, some, some services they can uh, connect with and then get some, some nice uh, features from the device. Um, it does have some some Java virtual machine, um, so that all applications that uh, typically are written in Java or a, a, a language that compiles to the Java virtual machine can be used. And then it has a large framework with a lot of APIs, so that um, uh, the API application development is uh, is, uh, is much easier. And uh, then it also comes with uh, some some very basic. Uh, applications for the end users, things like uh, uh, you know the, a, a clock app or a calendar, um, so that uh, you have the, your base operating system uh, without needing third-party applications for that. And all of these components that are mentioned here are open source, uh, developed mostly by Google. There's some inputs from uh, from uh, from both com open source community and um, uh, basically device manufacturers. Um, but the large majority is actually uh, developed by Google. Um, but when we're talking about Android open source project, we, uh, or when we're talking about Android, we're not only talking about the Android open source project, but we're talking typically about what runs on the end user device. And there's a few things that uh, are typically added to what is called Android um, that are not part of AOSP. Um, which can be, which is basically with three, three parts. Um, it is extensions to the application framework. So it adds more features to the, um, to the so that appli uh, applications can use. This is not used, uh, happen, doesn't happen that often anymore. It was very popular in the early days of Android. 
Um, nowadays, most features that you need are actually in the uh, AOSP application framework. Um, but back then, for example, if you wanted to support um, audio output with more than two channels, so more than stereo, then you needed some extension. And some manufacturer actually provided that extension, not open, open source. And at some point, Google made some alternative to that and made it open source. And now uh, we don't have that framework extensions a lot anymore. The only one that's still very, very popular, basically, or used in basically every device is uh, White Wine, which is a DRM system, which intentionally is not open source. And we have um, service apps. Um, there is always uh, typically uh, have to you know provide some services to the to the operating system uh, that are run in the background and not seen by the user itself, but um, may also be useful for third party apps. Um, and those uh, yeah uh, have various uh, different things they can do. Um, and the most popular one of them is actually also from Google, um, which I will talk about in a minute. And then we also have on typical Android distributions, a few more end user apps than the ones officially integrated in AOSP. Uh, one very popular one is probably the, the Play Store, which uh, people use to download applications, but uh, also many manufacturers add their own uh, applications or uh, ship with third party applications uh, uh that they think uh, are usable useful for the user to have on the device all right so um what do we have from google in there specifically and um besides uh, obviously that things from the from the manufacturer google also pushes a lot of stuff on those devices um basically enforced through the the, the licensing of the play store and uh, those provide a lot of features and uh, I, I listed a few here which is uh, um, some of you is those um, you might have already heard about but I, I will go through all of them so the first is uh, uh, GSM and Wi-Fi based location it's basically or it's also called Fomance GPS which is basically means that your phone can can find your location without having to actually use a, a GPS or alternative uh, uh, GNSS system, um, which basically means uh, uh, that you can uh, get information about your location much faster and even more accurate, and especially in buildings, than it would have been possible with a satellite-based system. Um, second uh, is maps, in-app maps. So basically, if you have some, uh, some application and it wants to display uh, maps in in there when maybe you have some nice markers on it and allow you to uh, select some location or something then uh, often uh, these applications do not want to ship with a full-blown uh, uh, map renderer and so on so they're just using a component provided by google that is already installed on most devices that uh, offers maps that with exactly that feature then another important component is push notifications um, which basically is, a, is an important part of uh, uh, making sure that your device battery time uh, is, uh, is much better because uh, uh, if applications in, uh, keep having uh, background connections to a service uh, and all applications do that, then uh, this could be bad for the battery uh, or it could, it could consume a lot of battery and then uh, your phone would not last as long. So uh, that's uh, something very useful, but uh, yeah, it's also not open source and it's uh, but it's provided by Google as a proprietary component. Um, then there's a computer vision SDK, uh, which has a lot of features actually, but uh, besides the QR code scanning, nobody uses anything of it. Um, so it's, uh, you could even call it QR code scanning SDK if you wanted to. Um, and uh, obviously, I guess you have already seen applications uh, that actually um, yeah, have a QR code scanner in there. And uh, they might be using that uh, SDK. Then the exposure notifications feature, which um, was uh, added in, in uh, well 2020 um, for COVID-related matters, to um, yeah basically allow tracked tracking not tracking tracing of uh, of uh, exposures, so that you can be warned. Uh, when there is uh, someone uh, that you have been in, 
in, in close contact with uh, in the last days uh, that got COVID, then you get a not can can get a notification for that. Uh, which is the system is also not open source. It was originally when Google published uh, the first version, they announced that they will make it open source in a future version of Android, and they're just putting it as part of their closed system so that they can easily update it with, without having any problem with manufacturers. But that open sourcing never happened. Um, then we have uh, uh, the, the device connectivity for, for FIDO or universal second factor devices. Um, so these, those, those are uh, these devices like YubiKey or NitroKey that you can you know, connect to your computer and use as a, as a, uh, as a, as a security key. And um, yeah, on Android, uh, uh, with the way to connect to those uh, or the intended way to connect to those is through a proprietary component by Google. There's also uh, other security related things like uh, the TLS library that is part of, uh, of Android is, tends to be a little bit outdated. So there's, and, and because uh, in, in the past we had some, uh, you might remember things like uh, uh, in, in severe issues in TLS libraries in the past. So at some point it was considered a good idea to uh, make the TLS library uh, updatable independent of the operating system. Uh, and also this is actually a part of a proprietary Google component. There's also other stuff that I haven't here on the slides, um, uh, but uh, I, I guess uh, uh, we can, uh, if you have a specific question about one of them, we can uh, cover that later. So uh, yeah, that's all kind, kind, all kind of stuff from Google. And uh, uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, MicroG is basically uh, about replacing those. Um, so providing uh, an alternative that is uh, fully compatible with what Google built so that applications that use these services or uh, components uh, run without any modifications. Um, so that, uh, uh, yeah, you can just install the application from uh, the, the, uh, the developer uh, just like they built them and run it on your device even if you don't have the Google services on it. Um, and then we obviously don't want to do it exactly the same way as Google did, but we want um, to not send as much data to Google so that users can have some more privacy. Um, and uh, at the same time, we want to try to also reduce the, uh, the energy consumption of, uh, of these services, um, which may sound like it's something hard, but if you're just skipping all the tracking and telemetry, then you're already doing a good good step in that direction. So um, uh, that's uh, kind of like for free, but it's also a very good thing, especially when we're talking about older devices, which often have not as good batteries anymore. So um, what the current status, um, basically most of the relevant features of, of Google services are implemented nowadays. Um, we, we have maps and we're using OpenStreetMap instead of, uh, of Google, of course. Um, then we have uh, the, the GSM-based location or Wi-Fi-based location, um, in this case, using a service provided by Mozilla. We have the push notifications, which unfortunately still have to run through the Google servers. But of course, the user can decide to not actually enable them if they don't want to have, so they do not have to have a persistent to connection to Google servers if they don't want to actually use push notifications through Google servers. For example, if they want to uh, uh, rely on an, on a third party system or an alternative system. Um, and, and basically data by risk that some apps might not be getting push notifications, then that's perfectly possible as well. And then, uh, we also have all these, uh, other, uh, features that I mentioned, uh, implemented and of course, all of them without any, any telemetry and when possible, uh, without any network connectivity at all, which is the case for the. Uh, many of these APIs that they actually do not need network connectivity um, because the logic can be purely on the device itself. We also have some, uh, for some of the uh, not so often used features that we have not implemented, we at least added some stops so that apps that try to use these features will not crash or cause any problems, but will just think that, uh, for example, you do not have any contacts in your Google account if you are have a, I mean, if, if, if the application would want to know that, so some apps, you know, ask for, give me the contacts of the Google account, which would then normally the Google system would then ask the user to confirm that they want to share the contacts with that application. Uh, and in our case, we just 
um, skip all that and just return an empty list of accounts uh, of, of contacts. So yeah, that's um, that's that's the current status. Um, but important to notice is uh, Google Play Services is, is, is evolving. So um, uh, many of the features we have now are only happened in the or only ad were added or or largely changed within the last two or three years, uh, like the COVID warnings, also the FIDO and uh, Universal Second Factor system um, uh, changed largely uh, in the last years um, with the development of WebAUSN, which is a new standard to use those devices. So um, yeah, the, the development is obviously still ongoing and, um, and, and also in many of the features, we just have them in the way where it works good enough for daily usage, but not necessarily 100% feature complete. So when adding new features and improving them uh, is still something uh, that is that's going on. Uh, so yeah, that's that's basically the, the short summary about uh, MicroG. So we have some quite some time for questions now. It was a little bit faster than I thought that I would be. So. Uh, Okay, yeah, banking apps, good, good topic. Um, so uh, many banking apps uh, use uh, uh, a system called safety net, um, or some banking apps at least do that. And uh, we do have an implementation of this thing called safety net, which is a proprietary system of Google. Um, the implementation works by basically downloading a blob and running it in a sandbox. Not that nice, um, uh, but uh, the only way to actually get it running, it's kind of like a DRM system and uh, it has a special feature that, or it, that's the, the problematic feature compared to other DRM systems that just reverse engineering with the current version doesn't really help because they can easily just update and they do that regularly. So um, yeah, the only way to use safety net is to actually um, actually run it, um, which we can we do support depending on the device, of course, um, but uh, not, not all devices also uh, support safety net with custom ROMs, so that's another issue. Um, banking apps that do not use safety net um, do typically do not have any problems with MicroG. Um, they might have still problems with custom ROMs, so there's uh, some banking apps that try to detect if the ROM is, uh, or the, the operating system used is the, uh, is the original manufacturer operating system, and uh, if they detect something like a Linux OS being used, they might want to, um, you know, not run on that device. So that is, uh, but that's independent of of, of MicroG, uh, and would also happen if you had installed the original Google services on on the custom operating system. Okay, so uh, Tarkin, if you want, you can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question, where do I use make micro G? Do I use it on top on the stock ROM or do I use it on top on a custom ROM? Um, and I, I had once, I did remove Google service on a, uh, on a normal stock ROM, but I don't know, I'm not sure of, uh, how, how I can set it up. Yeah, so uh, the the, the best and easiest way to use MicroG is to uh, use it with a custom ROM that already has it integrated. Um, Calyx OS would be an example. Um, there's also a, a Lineage OS fork called Lineage OS for MicroG, which includes MicroG. Um, so that's by far the easiest and, and, and also best way to, to install it. You can um, also install it in, um, uh, in custom ROMs that uh, uh, by, by modifying the custom ROM before or, or while installing it, um, which also um, is reasonably possible. It, technically, it is also possible to modify the uh, the stock uh, the stock ROM basically to uh, to include uh, to remove Google services and instead include MicroG. Um, I, I have done that in the past for someone, but uh, I would say that um, if if you're not willing to to put a lot of time and effort into it, it's not really a, a usable alternative. OK. 
Okay, thank you. It was clear. Okay, if there are no further questions right now, thank you very much, Marvin, for this very interesting presentation. Then it's time to move over to Hans Christoph in case he's already here. Are you here? If not, then we have a 10 minute break because we told Hans Christoph to be here at 7.30 and use this then now. That's a short break. So in case you want to refresh your water, Go to the bathroom, anything. This is the time. And see you here at 7.30 in eight minutes with Hans Christoph talking about effort.
Okay, thank you very much for your patience. It looks like Hans Christoph has issues and is not here. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to contact him right now, but um, doesn't seem to be available. Mm. So then I say we can start with a general question and answer session. So if you want to organize a workshop, what you still need to know, yeah, and where we can help you. Is it possible to ask a question? Sure, yeah, that's now the time. Now is the perfect time to ask a question. Uh, generally, please, let's make uh, a plus here, like I just did in the chat, in case you want to talk, or you can write a question in there. So then we have a order of appearance. Okay, so I actually have a question, because like you talked about using the Android phones, just as phones, and I was I had an, an idea to use it as a kind of like let's say server or something like this. So you can use it as some kind of like Raspberry Pi or something like this, and also you can connect it with uh, Arduino because also there is like many of them, and you can have GPIOs. Do you thought about using it, the old phones in this kind of way? I mean. As I have shown this in the presentation, yes, of course. I mean, we have this in in mind when we when we think about the political demands that we have and the universal right to install any software or any device. But in our workshops, this is not a topic. I mean, we would love. I mean, we love to see people who come and tell us stories about some creative hacks they have done or are planning to do with their phones. But this is usually not part of our workshops. And um, yeah, so I uh, have no uh, particular stories here to share. But yes, if you have, and uh, also I think it could be very interesting actually. So if you do workshops and there are people who have a uh, creative use of their phones in an afterlife or something, then it's also, it would be really interesting if you can share this with us. So, we can also make, I don't know, might, we might make a news about it or put it in a newsletter because this, these are the examples that show why phones are not only phones, but are universal uh, computers. I was like, uh, uh, ah, okay. No, please go ahead if you want. I just wanted to say that I, I tried to do this uh, with Termax and there is also an, another application, but I don't remember the name. It's also like allowing you to um, emulate the Linux on your phone. I forgot the name. There is like only two of them. And actually I failed. That, that's why I asked. Post -market. It's what? Postmarket OS? No, no, uh, like, I only way I had, because I don't have any phones which are, like, uh, able to run Linux. I just used the um, Linux OS and tried to emulate Linux inside, inside of them. And actually, I failed. That's why I was asking, but uh, I, I have still this in mind, so I hope I, I'm going to do this. <laughs> Mate. Are you uh, thinking about Termux, maybe? Uh, yes, 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 exactly. And there is also another one. Uh, I don't have my phone with me. Uh, but I, I forgot the name. I'm going to write it in, in chat. I know about Tamox, yeah. So that's kind of giving you um, access to a command line and some packages that you can install. Uh, yes, but I have I have I had problem with this. It was pretty long time ago, but I had some problem with this. A user land. It was user land. Ah, uh, user land, okay. And then, by the way, uh, Nico Riken, uh, one of the, his first message 
or one of the first is uh, he said something about a Dutch podcast uh, where somebody said they had managed to run an Nextcloud uh, server on their phone. Um, so I don't know which podcast he was talking about, but um, yeah, it's definitely possible to use it as a Nextcloud instance. Um, yeah, next then server. there's a question from Oliver saying, how huge is the threat if you use an old Android? You mean how, you mean, what, what do you mean is the threat of breaking the phone or, or what exactly is the threat here? You mean threat and like danger. Um, so. The threat of using an old Android, um, I can answer that question, I think. So Graphene OS, for that reason, um, they dropped the support as soon as um, the manufacturer, in this case, Google, doesn't give any more security updates for it because um, security updates also include updates for the firmware and the proprietary drivers. And yeah, if these are not uh, updated anymore, um, this can also pose a security risk. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely not as safe as one of the newer phones, but I, these security threats can also be or derive from the Android OS. So um, yeah, this is also uh, a thing. If you, if you have an older phone, but the newest Android version on it, I, I don't think uh, it's such a big issue. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, are there any more questions? Or maybe you can, I would also be interested who's actually planning a workshop here. Maybe you can put a, a oh, we have a question by Getty Miscon. So if you want to enable your microphone, you can ask a question or write it in the chat. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, so um, I, um, I have been using, I haven't been unlocking uh, phones for uh, since 2016. And I'm interested in try if some workshop is going to happen if, if for a for a future workshop. Um, but um, also, I want to talk about something. Uh, well, uh, I like Android. I think it has lots of problems as well for development. Um, because um, most of the development relies on uh, the Android Studio mostly. I, I don't know any good alternative to that. Although some components that are useful for uh, unlocking the devices uh, already exist as um, um, packages as uh, standalone packages. Um, the development uh, isn't uh, is much harder uh, than, for example, trying to uh, write something for uh, if the device run on uh, like uh, a Linux based a, a pure Linux distribution. Uh, it's my opinion on this. Uh, I don't know if someone agrees or disagrees. I, I want to hear, I want to know your opinion about that. Um, okay, so the first question was, I think, if there's any alternative to uh, Android Studio. Um, yeah, I, I think 
uh, I mean, it's in the end, it's just an IDE. I think you can program in any IDE and then um, have the developer tools uh, as you know on the command line. So I don't think you're you're bound to that, but it gives you a lot of nice features like the emulator and so on. Um, and the second question was uh, Android. I'm not sure actually. Is it that Linux is easier to develop on the phones than than Android? Maybe you can can uh, phrase your second question again. I mean. Generally, I think um, I think this is not the best uh, location to discuss developing uh, methods on in Android, in Linux, and phones. Here's about the workshops. We can happily talk about developing apps for phones at some other session. But let's uh, for now oh, all right. stick, stick here to, right. to the workshops because. Um, the workshops yeah, um, do not have some, nothing to do with uh, development. Oh, and... yeah, I, I see. So, yeah, uh, I think uh, I, I would like to see um, what, what's, go what's going to happen with future workshops. As I'm, I would be very, I would be glad to help any people who are, who are interested in flashing devices. Uh, I have, I had. Quite a, I have, I mean, in my second device right now that it's purely flashed. So, yeah, okay, it, it's cool. it's an interesting uh, thing. Trying to, uh, yeah, um, excuse. Me. Yeah, maybe you can just recall how, because you also just said you are interested in running a workshop. So let's recall how how running a workshop. So. Obviously, the most important thing is don't do it alone. Get some get some friends helping you. No matter the background, as long as they can flash phones, that's fine. And get a location, of course. So yeah, we have the we we were running our workshops with a ratio of four to five persons per trainer. For a person who, who knows how to flash phones. And once you have settled that, then you can write a mail to upcycling at fsv.org. I just put it into the chat. Upcycling at fsv.org. And then you can say, hey, we are planning a workshop. We want to run it on this and that date, in this and that town. Um can you help us get the message out? Can we have a short call or something about what what to do, what to think about? And then we can figure that out. I think these are the most the most basic information to take away from here. If you want to do a workshop, find some friends to do it together, find a location, and then write to upcycling at fsv.org and we figured out how we can help you in doing that. Are there now questions about the workshops or process, the material? Um, oh, that might be one. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, just uh, uh, regarding the question from Gabri, he was wondering about um, his phone not getting any official supports from LineageOS anymore. I think they ju just might have dropped it, but um, Oftentimes, some people continue providing support unofficially on the XDA forums. And um, yeah, just check uh, 
the three points I mentioned, I mean, the most important one being it's open source. There's an open source version of it uh, on, uh, on XDA, then you can use that, uh, generally speaking. Uh, yeah, question by Stuart. You can unmute yourself. Uh, well, I did. <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm thinking about organizing a workshop. I had I have some experience to flash, I flash some phones by myself, uh, some with Lineagos OS, with Diffist OS. I tried, I tried with Ubuntu Touch. And, also, Postmark OS, but uh, yeah, you said when you should do it not alone. But I don't have any people I know <laughs> who, sh with, who I should do it together. But, uh, yeah, maybe I can find somebody. But yeah, I I just liked it, the idea to try it and to look what happens and what kind of people are coming. Maybe to provide some phones which are flexible and people can use. Uh, I just always buy the most cheap phones on eBay and just try it. It's, the, the risk is not so big if it is not working. Uh, yeah, that's what I would like to share now. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think the question being if there are any people uh, in your area that uh, get, could help you, or I mean, I think we already addressed the question like how can you uh, organize the workshop and promote it promote it um, via our channels um yeah and where, where are you based i mean that's a good question i think in, uh, maybe in our... bielefeld so that's uh, nearby bielefeld okay that's so yeah we maybe. if you announce that we can definitely um you know share it via our channels and there might be some you know, There's some a local mailing list for. Isn't that Rhineland? Bielefeld? I'm not sure. Yeah, also Germany. Uh, uh, oh, mailing yes. list. So we have local mailing lists where you can say, hey, I want to do a, a, an upcycling Android workshop. There's still someone here who wants to join me. And or you can send a mail, what I said, to supporters in the region of Bielefeld, like 20 kilometers around. Saying hi. hey, hi, I'm uh, I'm here. I would love to do an upside Android workshop with someone here joining me, and then you can connect. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah it's about 50, kilo, 50 kilometers from Bielefeld, so it's a little bit further. Um, yeah. yeah, I I will look. Here's Alessandro uh, saying he is quickly, in saying uh, tomorrow there's a workshop in Cologne. If you're interested in uh, going there um, at 4 p.m. from 4 to 8. We have it uh, announced on our website. So, and this is of course true for anybody here. So if you look for people joining you, in the workshop, the local FSFE mailing list and the option to contact supporters in a certain region couldn't be very helpful in finding new friends and making a workshop together. All right, I think if we have no more questions, we can wrap it up. Uh, I want to say thank you all for being here and um, having so many questions. That was really helpful uh, to actually make it interactive as well. Um, and yeah, maybe exchange contacts with each other if you want to keep texting, um, because otherwise we will close down the room soon. and. Um, 
yeah, we'll give you give you the time to exchange contacts, and then um, yeah, I hope to to see you in one of our workshops, or even better, um, organizing one of the workshops on your own. Uh, and then yeah, please let us know um, if you do, because we can help you with that. We can promote that on on the FSFE channels, and um, yeah. Eric, anything you want to add to that? No. no. Okay. Remember upcycling at fsv.org in case you found a team, you want to run a workshop, let us know. And then we go from there, go through the steps, help you in promotion and organizing. And uh, yes, we would be very happy seeing some of you doing a workshop and bringing out the message. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, thank you again. And see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you for joining.